The human body organizes neurons and muscles into units we call motor units. Now simply put, a motor unit consists of the motor neuron as well as all the muscle cells that that particular motor neuron innervates. So to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So let's suppose we have a single muscle cell as shown in red. So the muscle cell is also known as the muscle fiber or the myocardium. Site. So we have a single motor neuron that comes from the central nervous system and it basically connects its synapses with our muscle cells. So this is the axon of the motor neuron that's coming from the central nervous system and it basically splits in its synapses with our muscle cell. And at the given synapse, we have the neuromuscular junction where our neurotransmitter acetylcholine basically transfers the action potential from the a neuron to our muscle cell. So basically this muscle cell shown in red as well as the motor neuron is our motor unit and in this particular case the motor unit only consists of a single muscle cell and a single motor neuron. Now a single motor neuron always consists of a single neuron but it can have thousands of muscle cells. So we have thousands of these different types of muscle cells in a bundle and that is our motor neuron. Now within the muscle cell we have many of these uh, fibers known as myofibrils and these myofibrils themselves consist of the sarcomere unit. So sarcomere units consist of the myosin and the actin protein. Now in our body we have many of these motor units. Now, whenever we're carrying out an activity that basically requires a very small force, we only use several or few of these motor units. But if we're conducting some activity that requires a large force, we have to use many of these motor units. And motor units can basically work together to carry out a motion in a coordinated and smooth fashion. So many different motor units can work together to create smooth and coordinated motion. If a certain activity requires a small force, a small number of motor units are actually used. On the other hand, if the activity requires a relatively large force, when for example we're lifting some type of heavy object, many motor neurons are actually used. Now, typically small muscles, like the muscles found in our fingers, require few motor units, while large muscles, like the muscles in our legs, require a larger number of motor units. So let's take a look at the following diagram to see what we mean by a motor unit. So let's suppose we have the biceps muscle, the triceps muscle, and this is the central nervous system, our spine, as well as our brain brain. So we have one motor neuron, the second motor neuron, and the third motor neuron. Now every one of these motor units begin, or every one of these motor neurons begins in the central nervous system. And that means each one of these motor neurons, their dendrites and the cell bodies originate, begin at the central nervous system. Now the axon of the motor neuron basically extends and the axon terminal of each one of these motor neurons basically ends up at the muscle cells that they control. So motor neuron number one as well as all the muscle cells that motor neuron number one controls is known as motor unit number one. The same thing uh, goes for number two. We have motor unit number two that consists of motor neuron number one and the muscle cells that it controls and the same thing is true for motor neuron number three. Motor neuron number three creates motor unit number three that consists of this neuron as well as the muscle cells that it actually controls. Now, there are three things that actually affect the magnitude, the quantity of force that is produced by our muscles. So let's discuss what these three things are. And let's begin with bullet point number one, the size of the motor unit. Now, 
what do we mean by the size of the motor unit? So earlier we said that a single motor unit can consist of thousands of muscle cells. So basically those motor units that have more muscle cells will create a greater force than those that have less muscle cells. So to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So in this diagram, in blue, we have our motor neuron and this is basically a fascicle. So recall that a fascicle is basically a bundle. It's a collection of many of these muscle cells, of many of these muscle fibers. So this is one uh, muscle cell. Now, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight of these muscle cells in this given fascicle. So this motor unit consists of a single motor neuron and only eight muscle cells. But if we examine this larger motor unit, this consists of many more of these muscle cells, of many more of these muscle fibers inside, inside the entire fascicle. And so because this motor unit consists consist of many more of these muscle cells, this larger motor unit will be able to exert a larger force. So that's what we mean by the size of the motor unit affects the magnitude of the force that is produced by that particular motor unit. Now let's move on to number two. So number two states that the number of motor units involved also affects the magnitude of the force that is produced produced. That means if we have more of these motor units that are involved in creating that motion, we're going to produce a greater force. Likewise, if we have less of these motor units involved, we're going to produce a smaller force. Now, to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram once more. So let's suppose I take the following marker and I try to curl my hand. So I try to basically raise the marker. I try to exert a force that basically does work against the force of gravity, which is pulling down on this marker. Now, because the marker has a small mass, that basically means I'm going to have to apply a small force to actually move this marker against the force of gravity. So that means because I'm going to have to apply a smaller force, I'm only going to have to use a small number of motor neurons. So let's suppose I'm only using motor unit number one that involves motor neuron number one as well as these muscle cells that it actually innervates. Now, instead, let's suppose instead of raising this marker, I take some type of weight. And that weight, let's suppose, has a very large mass. So now, because I'm trying to lift a very large mass, I'm going to have to use many more motor, uh, many more motor units. And so now, let's suppose I'm using all three of these motor neurons, and that means I'm using all three of these motor units. And this, as a result of me using more of these motor units, I will produce a greater force because more of these motor units contain more of these muscle cells and so I will exert a greater force. So if we stimulate many motor uh, units to carry out a certain activity, this will produce a greater force than if we use a smaller number of motor units. And this is simply because more motor units means we're using many more muscle fibers, many more muscle cells. And finally, let's move on to number three. So the thickness of the muscle cells also influences the uh, uh, the force, the magnet of the force that we're creating. And this is exactly what happens when we exercise. So let's take a look at the following muscle cell. So this individual single muscle cell, single muscle fiber consists of many of these myofibrils found inside the cytoplasm of that muscle cell. Now these myofibrils basically are made up of adjacent units we call sarcomeres. And these sarcomeres themselves are composed of myosin and actin. Now when we continue 
continually exercise on a daily basis, what happens is we actually increase the number of myosin and the number of actin in, inside each sarcomere. And that in turn increases the thickness, increases our diameter of each one of these myofibrils. And over time, because our thickness of each of these myofibrils is increased, the entire thickness and diameter of the muscle cell will increase as well. And because it's the actin and the myosin that basically uh, move along each other to produce our force, it's these that create the force in the first place, a thicker muscle cell means we're essentially producing a larger force. So, when we exercise often, we increase the thickness of the individual myofibrils found inside each muscle cell by increasing the number of actin and myosin in those myofibrils. This in turn increases our thickness, our diameter of that muscle cell. A muscle cell with a larger thickness, a larger diameter will exert a greater force than one with a smaller one. So this basically concludes our discussion on the motor unit. So the motor unit is nothing more than the motor neuron as well as all the muscle cells that that particular motor neuron actually controls. And we have different types of motor units found inside our body. And these motor units basically work together to create a coordinated and smooth uh, motion.